Well, hello to my third video about UFO 2000. The first two ones were about setting up and installing the game. This um, video here is about how to play the game. The game draws its mechanics from original XCOM. And the games are therefore very similar. But they have some tiny differences. And I'm going to show you how to set up your game meaning what to do before you are in battle and what to do in battle, what you should uh, avoid, where are some problems. And for this I'm going to start UFO 2000 right away. I'm starting it in full screen mode. It doesn't need to be started in full screen mode, but I like it better this way. And here you can see a few options you have can connect to an internet server or you can start a hot seat game which means you're playing on one computer against someone else on the same computer. You can also load a replay, set some options, but for this video I will show you first how to connect to the server. But this time I already um, entered the server address and the password. As you see it didn't ask for it because I turned on auto login. In my first two videos, videos I already told you that there are some problems with this function. You can see the game doesn't ask for anything. It just connects to in a server, which is standing right beside me. It's my own server. It's not an internet server, but you can set up one yourself. And this is mine and it didn't ask for any credentials or something like that. But the game has to know those credentials and it's stored in the ini file. So if you are connecting to any internet service, never use passwords that are valuable to you because they are saved in plain text. It's not a big deal if you're using low priority passwords, but it could be one if you do so. So please refrain from using passwords that are somehow special or you're using on different services. Well, this is the internet interface. As you can see, it's only me connected to the server. This is very often the case, but usually there is the option to just wait for other players. And if you say, okay, there's nothing to do for me around here, I can't see any, anything, then you can switch with F10 to the windowed mode, and then you can go wherever you like, and then you can switch back with F10 as well. Usually if there were any other players you would see a list here, which are also in white, or if they are engaged in battle they are red. And there are ways to get into a game. Two ways. One is you challenge someone. This means the player will have a um, yellow um, name, not white. If you click on the name it turns yellow and this means you have challenged someone. The other way around, if someone is challenging you, you will hear, hear a beep and you, your name will, uh, the name of the player will turn green. Then you can click on this player's name and then you are entering another screen. I will disconnect from my server here to show you how this may look. Because for this video, I'm not doing this over a internet server, I'm doing this in hot seat. This has the advantage that you can see the looks of the game from both sides, your side and the side of your opponent, because the game um, records your whatever you enter here, whatever you do. And then next step, when you give, um, if you end your turn, then your opponent would be switching the seat and would see whatever you had done. This means um, he cannot see what you're doing or see what you see during the turn when you are playing, but he has to turn away from the screen. This gives you a possibility to play one versus one on a computer without it, any internet connection. So in order to have it fair, you, your opponent shouldn't see what you are doing and vice versa. In this case, it already opened this settings screen where you prepare your battle and there's a lot to be seen. First of all, you have this list of um, soldiers. I'm going to go into more details for this in a few moments. You see the map 
and you see some uh, borders around certain parts of the map. You see this setting box, which I will tell you a lot in the few, next few minutes. And there are those buttons here. Normally, if you're playing over internet, then you would have to press the send button. And your opponent will also have to press the send button. And only if both ha have um, clicked on send, then both can click on start and the actual battle starts. As this is hot seat, it's a little bit different. I will press on send and then on start. Then the screen will turn black. And the other player would be able to do the same settings on his side to change whatever he wants and set up his platoon, set up his unit positions and so on while I'm turning away. As I'm playing alone here, just to show you how the game works, that doesn't matter. But I'm going to tell you about the details of U of O2000. And first thing are the game settings I want to tell you about. There is, for example, the game mode. You have this deathmatch here. This is quite a classical game. You have two players. They set up their units in these boxes. The green one for player one and the red one for player two. And it's, it's uh, the starting position of all your units. You cannot place them anywhere else. For example, if I use this place, it simply refuses. But I can set it here, for example. But there are other modes as well. There is this escape mode. Escape means the player one has to move its leader to the other end of the map. So in our case, from the left to the right side. And his opponent, the player two, has only one job. This is to kill the leader. And if he, he does so, he succeeds. And if he does not, and you enter the right side of the screen as player one, with your leader unit, then you have one. It's a little bit more challenging than killing everyone because you have a certain goal to do, not just killing everything. And then there is um, control. Control means you must control this 10 times 10 area in the center. On this map, it looks a little bit nonsense, but if you go to... Hey. go to 5 times 5, then it would be this area in the middle. Whoever has more units in the center is controlling this part of the map and you can select how long um, one must hold this position. And um, whoever does this succeeds. And then there is assassination. Assassination is a little bit uh, similar to the to the escape um, mode, with one difference. You don't need to get a certain unit on the other side of the map. You simply need to kill your opponent's leader. And this is always the first unit in list. So in this case, it's this soldier. And, well... The game is over if this unit is killed. That's the goal of the assassination mode. And then there is hold. On hold you must save at least half of your squad until the end of the match. You can set these numbers of turns or half turns here. For example you can say let's say move to 10 uh, rounds, meaning everybody is having five, um, 5 times the ability to move its units. And if you keep your half of your squad as player 1, then you have succeeded, you have won. If your opponent, the player 2, kills more than half of your units, then he has won. And then there is breakthrough. Breakthrough means you must bring at least half of your squad to the other side of the map. And your opponent, the player 2, has to prevent you from doing so. Rather easy. And then there is capture. Capture means the player 1 must capture the enemy leader. Also the first one in this mode. 
in the list of the player 2's units. If you capture him, but not killed him, that's important, you must stun him, then you have one. That's your job. And then you will have to bring him to the other side of, of the map. And there's yeah, one, one advantage for the attacking um, player, the player 1. He can see it on his minimap. So you cannot see the minimap here, but in the in-game you would see that there is one um, unit marked. So you know where to go. So it doesn't make sense for player, um, for the player two to hide somewhere. And then there is also search and destroy. Search and destroy uh, is well pretty much like the deathmatch mode, just with um, random starting points. In, in that manner that you can choose your own starting points, but you do not know where your opponent is starting. He can place his units anywhere on the map, as can you. But this is a little bit um, more surprising, because you will never know if first round you enter in a room where everybody is in, or maybe you are even starting at a point where uh, enemy units are right next to you or not. This is quite a surprise sometimes. Well, that's all about those um, scenarios or modes. You have already seen I can choose this map or manipulate it in some way. This is when you click here on the map name and you have several options. First of all, you can always generate one new randomly. You can choose the size. You could even load or save certain setups if you think, hey, this map is quite nice, let's save it. And you can load it another time. And of course you can change the terrain. This one is Arctic UFO Yard. But you could, for example, take City with a double click. And then you would have a setup like this. Let's say 4 times 4 You can regenerate it as often as you like. Mm, usually it's um, it's good advice to take a map that is, that is rather um, rather fair. In this case, I think it would be quite okay. But if you generate something like, let's say, something like that, for example. This is, here you don't have any building at all, while your opponent already can start in some buildings. I think this is not quite fair, because he has already cover while you don't have any. You might have a look at this. Um, yeah, there's also the option to set the daylight. I don't know if it was here. No, then it was here. This is the lighting level. For those of you who have already played XCOM, it's pretty much like um, missions at night. You can say 16, that's bright daylight, or you can say, okay, Let's turn it down a little, make it night, down to 6. This is darkest night somehow, and this um, limits your line of sight, in this case to 6 tiles, or to 7 I believe, and meaning you have don't, you don't can see very far, and therefore you will have difficulties to explore the map. If you say it's a 6x6 six six map, and you set up lighting 6, it could be quite a problem to find your opponent's unit it's at all. So it depends. And this option has one little drawback. Sometimes it behaves a little um, strange. Normally one would um, expect that this lighting goes only for yourself. But sometimes if you have an enemy unit walking around you, you will see that your lighting changes without you moving. So somehow you already know that an opponent's unit is around you without seeing it actually. This is why I usually don't like to use this lighting setting and I believe it's more fun to have bright daylight. Well, and here we are already in this um, settings box where we can also set up the points. If you have played XCOM 1, then your only limitation was how many items can your soldier carry and how many items could be 
put into, for example, the Sky Ranger or the Avenger craft. In this case, you don't have limitations like that, but you can set up a so-called points limit. This case is it's fifteen thousand points, and as you who can see, I'm have already fourteen thousand forty thousand nine hundred eighty-five points with this squad. I will show you how to change that, but you can um, set it up for a game rule. This is something we will have to discuss with your opponent. If you say, okay, um, let's make it classical 7k, then you have 17,000 points, which limits you in units, in items. I will keep it at 15,000. But this is something you will have to discuss with, with your opponent, which, whatever you two prefer. You could also limit the number of turns one can, one game could go. This, um, well, it's useful if you say, I don't want to play open end yeah so you can say okay um let's do it for 10 rounds and if nobody has succeeded after t uh, round 10 then it's a draw i will set it back to zero because i don't want any limitations here you can do the same with time limit for one turn so let's say your opponent um decides hey i'm losing so if it's my turn, I don't want to move anymore. Let the other player disconnect. So making him lose. This is preventing him. You can say one round should go, let's say, 300 seconds, which is five minutes. Which would mean after 300 seconds, the turn is automatically ended. So your opponent could not wait until forever, until you um, disconnect from the game quite useful if there are some people around to mess with the game in this fashion. You could also set up um, what is seen of the map when you start. In this case, um, number one means this area around your starting point is already explored and whatever your soldiers are seeing at this moment when you start. There's two, which means the co entire map is explored. You can see everything of the map and there is also level zero. This means nothing is explored except for those parts your soldiers are already facing to. I prefer two, but it's a question of the taste. And there is one um, option you can say, could one start with items on the ground or not? I'm going into more details when I come to the inventory screen. Usually I turn it off, but um, actually I don't use it at all. Okay. Now to the points, limits, and edi editing your soldiers. You have here a list with 15, uh, 14 soldiers. And of course you can place them somewhere. It's obvious. But you have no idea what those soldiers um, are capable of at this point. So if you hold the control key, you click on a soldier. You can see the soldier and his inventory. For those who have played XCOM 1, this should look very familiar. You can choose what weapons they carry, grenades or knives or other types of items. And, uh, well, it depends on what tactic you are about to play on your opponent. You have certain information on the screen. For example, you have what is the weight of this equipment? In this case, it's 11 or 25. 25 is the limit my soldier can carry. And 11 is what the grenade and the rifle and its clip are weighing. If you overload this, you will have problems with your time units. But I'll tell you more about that later. And you have, of course, this soldier, soldier cost. These are the points the soldier cost. So if you have set up 15,000 points and you have 15 soldiers, this means one soldier cannot, or in, on average, one soldier shouldn't um, cost more than 1,000 points. In this case, it's 830. So I have a few left for other soldiers. For example, to give one a sniper laser rifle and armor. Now, how do I change the armor? This is by clicking on the soldier. 
And there you can see you can set up quite a lot of other things. Of course the name, you can switch the race if you want to, you can make him a mutant for example, or a chrysalid. There are certain limitations to the abilities of those um, units. For example, if you choose ethereal, it won't have psi abilities and chrysalid won't make the opponent into a zombie. So forget about that. They behave simply as units which can carry weapons and throw grenades and things like that, but they will not have any special abilities. I will stick to human. And as a human, you can choose also which type of armor they have. You can say, okay, I don't want, a want any one, uh, any um, armor. I want a standard one. This is what I have here, the blue one. You have a power suit and a flying suit, which are, uh, well, a little bit more armored and the flying suit, uh, of course, can fly. I will stick to the standard. And you could also choose um, the looks of a unit. But in fact, this is just a question of taste. This doesn't change anything according to the game. More important are those um, values around here. Um, if you have never played XCOM, then I probably have to tell you a little bit more about the mechanics, but I will do this on the Battlescape. For the moment, it should be sufficient if you know you can set up these time units, which affect what you can do each round, how much time you have, stamina, health, bravery doesn't matter. You can change this. Uh, you can change this at all. You have a probability of reactions. How good is your soldier as at reaction uh, reacting when you're not playing? If it's your opponent's turn. How good is the accuracy of firing and throwing, and also the strength? I uh, already told you about. The value here, equipment weight, and this 25 corresponds to the strength. I could also set it up a little bit more. For this, I would have to limit throwing ability or, well, let's take stamina. Stamina now is 50, meaning I have 10 points left. And strength is the one item that uh, costs double. If I go up, you will see it's not um, 35, it's 30 because Every point of strength will cost two points in general. I'll set that back. I have ten button, um, left. And go up with stamina again. And this strength uh, basically limits how much your soldier can carry. Okay, now if you want to switch through those soldiers, you have two, um, two ways. You can use those arrows with your mouse. Or you can use tap and shift tap to go back and forth. You have here a, um, a big variety of weapons which you can choose from. And well, it depends on your wep uh, weapon settings. You could also change them. If you have no mouse over one of them, you can see here this list of options you have. And you could also change the weapon set. This can be done with um, F5. And they have quite a list of um, of um, weapon sets. You have Galactic, you have modified XCOM weapons, you have original Terror from the Deep weapon set, and you have the UFO 2000 Classic set. It depends on whatever you want to play with your opponent. Usually it's XCOM unchanged. Uh, where is it? Yeah, here. Original XCOM weapon set. This is what you are used to if you have played XCOM 1. Or you use the UFO 2000 classic set, which I'm using right now. If you choose to change the weapon set, you can see my, ma my mouse cursor here is limited into some borders here. I cannot get out. You will have to use the cursor keys. Unless you have a lower screen resolution. I'm playing at HD resolution. If you're playing at, let's say, 640 times 480, then this um, selection window will be more to the left and more to the top. So as I'm playing on HD um, resolution, I will have to choose with cursor keys. And um, if I switch to XCOM weapon set, you will see some items 
I already chose are red. This red means you can't use this weapon in this weapon set. So if something of this um, of this kind is um, seen, then you will have to get rid of those um, items as you cannot use them. I'll switch back to UFO 2000 Classic set. But as you can see um, here, those were the original XCOM weapons, but UFO 2000 weapon settings is a little bit more appealing, I believe. Um, well, there is, well, little to say about using those weapons, but you will also um, have to consider how much they cost. I already told you this cost here is in principle the limiting, fa limiting factor what you can do with your squad. But um, if you have 15,000 points as a limit, you cannot exceed it or you have to take a fewer soldiers. And, well, if I drop this grenade, the guy gets a little bit cheaper. I'm giving it the grenade back. If I give him, uh, let's say, um, another clip for his rifle, he's getting more expensive. And in principle, everything you set up here has some sort of cost. Even if you change the stats, let's say I make him a really slow guy with 50 time units, this makes him a little bit cheaper, but 30 points lesser and having 30 less time units, that's rather expensive. So I keep it at that. Also the armor and the race changes the cost of a soldier. In general with the settings here you can um, give 140 points. I recommend always using all of them. So have zero points remaining. Because I believe it's it's rather um, expensive to have this disadvantage for a few points more here. Um, yeah. As I already said, Aetheris uh, have no Psy, so do Sectoids, and so do your um, own soldiers. You will not find any Psy Amp or something like that. You cannot control enemies' units. This has not been implemented, I believe. This won't uh, be the case anytime soon. What you also will be missing is a blaster. If you have played XCOM 1, you probably know about the blaster weapon. And for a... One versus one player game, the blaster is just too overpowered. Imagine you have, let's say, five or six soldiers of your, let's say, 15 soldiers standing around and your opponent is shooting with a blaster in your direction in the first round, then the game is, well, pretty much messed up at this point. So you you wouldn't uh, have a lot of fun if the blaster were being used. So the, the code is chose not to implement it. I find that quite nice, but you will have to consider this for any tactics. There are no Psy, there are no Blasters, so it's a little bit different to XCOM. Um, if you have decided, okay, this is my preferred setup for, let's say, 15,000 points, you have also the option to load and save with F2 and F3. If I say F3, take... Um, a two versus two setup. It's a little bit more heavy in this case. Well, this would be one of those two I would be using. But you could also save it if you have changed it, of course. I'll switch back to the 15k setup I have already saved. If I would modify it a little bit, I could save it and this will um, save you a lot of time when setting up a game. If you have play this game a little more often, then you will find it quite useful that you don't have to set up your soldiers every time from scratch. This is basically it. So make use of it, it will save you a lot of time and give you more time for playing. Um, yeah. This is about editing the units. So now let's come to placing them, actually placing them. Because there are some um, some tricks involved. Let's ch change the map for this a little. Uh, where's, where can we see this? Yeah, okay. Let's take the, the warehouse here. 
in general, you can uh, place your units in these mark fields. Except if you're changing the game mode, but usually it's played as deathmatch, where you have those limitations. But some modes, as I already told you, don't have these limitations. So I can say, let's start here with this soldier, the other one here, and so on. Sounds a little bit um, dull, a little bit easy, but there are some tricks you should be aware of. There is one trick to get your units onto the second floor. Every map can have several floors. You are only displayed um, this first level, but there's of course a second and a third level. And if there is some uh, obstacle, like this chair here, you would imagine, okay, it would start somewhere on the chair, but game mechanics um, works a little bit different in this case. This small house here is rather flat, it has just one level, so there's the second level is basically the roof. So this unit here sitting on this uh, table will not be standing on the table, but on the roof. So we have placed your unit effectively on the roof of the, um, the building. But there is also the possibility that you cannot move it anywhere on this point. For example, here you have some sort of lighting and you cannot place the unit here. It's impossible to place the, the unit there. So it depends on the map and what is above. But if there is a building and there are some obstacles, usually the unit is set on top of the building or the next floor. Okay. Now for a few other things I will have changed. I will have to change the map again. It's a little bit um, too small. If you have 4 times 4 then you won't have far to go until your opponent's unit sees you and probably reacts, which I will show you in a few minutes. Um, yeah, you will always have to to keep the layout of the map in mind because some things are a little bit special. Some of the buildings, not of this particular type, but some other buildings have um, some drawbacks. For example, you will start at a point where you have to walk all the way around the building to get out of it. In this case, there is no such building, but be aware that some tiles of the maps are a little bit problematic if you place your units there. And what you should also be aware of is there's one setting you could... Um, switch on or off. It's the setting if your units are kneeling, if you are second player. The player who challenged is player one. The challenged player is player two. So player two is the one who gets the second part of the first round and therefore cannot do anything until the first player has done his moves. And kneeling will make your units aim a little bit more accurately. So you can switch this option on and say, okay, if I'm player 2 and I will have to wait until player 1 um, has made his move, then it would be of advantage for my guys to wait kneeling, which gives them a little bit higher accuracy. This is something you can set up in the game options. It's a question of taste and also a question of the size of the map. If you're using 6x6 maps, you probably won't need it. For 4x4, it is quite useful sometimes. So let's do some settings of the soldiers so that I can show you a little more of the game mechanics. And I'm getting all of them out here. Just to have plenty of possibilities. Uh, defense, defense, defense. Huh. It's actually not really important at this point, so I choose anyway. And as we, as I already said, we are in hot seat, so I have to press send and then start. And now it already asks if I'm finished, because at this point I'm done as first player. Now I have a moment to switch seats with someone, so that the second player doesn't see where I'm starting, what options I've used and so on. So switching to player 2, doing pretty much the same.
And then you can also um, remove a suture with right-clicking. There's not a, only that option to set your soldiers, but also to remove them. And, well, I'm all, I'm about to be done right now. All, already done. And also doing start here. Now it's time to switch seats. Game gives you the option to wait for a moment. Well, and as you can see, uh, I'm using not the original XCOM interface, but the UFO 2000 interface. It's a little bit different in its looks, but it's a little bit um, small. First thing I do, I will increase the map size with the shift keys. You can use shift and um, cursor keys to right and left, where you can um, turn on the minimap, which is on the right here, and the list of soldiers and some other sets. You can do the same with the cursor keys down and up. So it's a little bit uh, more accurate. And you can see quite a lot if you're using HD resolution, it's a lot to see. You can also switch this to even more by pressing the star button. The star button gives you a little bit more overview. Pressing it again will zoom in back. I find that quite useful and make use of it. You can also see there's a chat console on the lower part of the screen where you can enter whatever you want. If you're playing online, these messages will be relayed to your opponent. If you're playing hot seat, they will be displayed, uh, I believe, when the opponent's turn is. But in general, in, on internet games, you will have instant chat messages back and forth, so it's a little bit more interesting this way, not as boring if you're waiting for the other player to end his turn. You can also limit this to no chat console if you want to, but, well, kind of makes the thing a little bit useless. Okay, what else? I already told you about the minimap here. And as you can see, there are those yellow dots. Those yellow dots are your soldiers. If they were red, then uh, those were opponents' units. You can also see there's some sort of fog of war, this, which keeps the map a little bit more in gray, and there are little parts which are a little bit more, um, a little bit better lighted, and those are the parts you can see. If I choose this unit and turn it to the right, you see it changes where I can see. And you can already see there are some problems with the lighting if you are using a little bit less line of sight because you want to play darkness or something like that. Um, usually it should be just like a triangle here and you see on the right part of this triangle there are some parts which are not seen, which is illogical. Um, yeah, you can see below this um, minimap also some stats. You can see local 15, which means you have 15 soldiers on your side. You have also a list of soldiers below that with the names and the stats. In this case, it's the time units and the health and armor. You can see I have a few units which have a little bit more armor. Those are the blue guys, which have um, 50 and the others with 12. It's a useful feature because you know which units are damaged, which are having a problem. So you can withdraw them and you instantly see if there are some replacements for them. So you don't have to go over inventory or stat screen. As you can also see in red, remote 15. This means your opponent still has 15 units left in this case. It shows you how many enemy units are out there. Um, yeah. There's also, as I said, a possibility to show those stats. If you click on this bar. Whoop, at least I thought so. Ah, that's the stats button. Sorry, I'm not using this interface a lot. 
But here you can see all of your uh, unit stats. Let's move it a little bit up. You have see, you can see those 78 time units. You have 60 energy, 50 health, and so on and so on and so on. The game is um, rather logical, so you will have to keep in mind all of those stats somehow. This uh, armor, for example, is very important because it makes your units more resilient. If it's down, then every shit, uh, shot that is arriving at your unit will go right through and decrease health. If health is zero, then your unit is dead. There's no way to ri revive it, so this unit is finished then. Energy and time units are important because they limit what you can do. For example, I already turned this guy and he has 78 time units instead of 80, so this turning cost two time units. If I turn him back, another two. But you can see nothing else changes. Now, if I move him one step forward, then also the energy has been decreased. And this is kind of um, stamina. If you let them run around a lot, then your energy is dissipated and there's a important difference between time units and energy. While time units are replenished every turn, so if you're again playing, you have 80 time units instead of, let's say, 50, you will always get 100%, but energy is not restored 100% every round. So if your unit is running around a lot, then energy is reduced, but not replenished completely every turn, so you will st uh, or you might end up with a unit that has full time units but no energy or just a little energy so you won't have the ability to run around any further but you could still be able to um, change things in your inventory throw things shoot or turn but the moment the energy is zero you cannot walk anymore okay um as I said, uh, this moving costs time units. So the question is, well, how much does it cost? And you can always look at it by pressing the control key. This will show you what way the unit will be taking and also what it costs. In this case, you can see I will um, end up with eight time units left if you go this way, which I'm doing now. And if I right click, I can abort this moving. But as you see, the moment I click on a place, it will instantly begin running. So be careful where you click. This right click option is nice if you have done a mistake, but it already has, then has cost you time units, which is a problem. So be aware that every move you do um, should be planned carefully and every click should be carefully. Otherwise you might end up with a screwed up gain just because of time of a tiny little mistake and you can already see here i have 23 um, energy units left but no time units left next round if you look at this bar you will see it will not have 60. okay and then there are these two buttons here you can jump to the next unit and you can also jump to the next unit and say okay never get back to the guy i'm already focused on which is i will which I will do now, because this guy has no time units, there's nothing I can do with him anymore. Switch to the next. In this way, you can switch through all your units. And you could, of course, take a special unit you want to choose right away without going to click here. You can also use the tab key and switch through the, uh, all units. In this case, the shift tab won't work as in the inventory screen. It will always go to the next soldier. But it's a quick way to, uh, to switch soldiers, so it's still nice. Um, yeah, there's also the point that um, if you go to a door, And you want to go through. In this case, um, the unit doesn't ask for anything. You will have to open it manually. Okay, this guy has run around a little bit too much. Let's see if this one has enough time units left. Yeah, so I can show you 
what to do about doors because units won't go through them automatically. You will always have to open them manually by right clicking behind the door. And only then you can go into this building. If you fail to right click behind the door, as you already say, have seen, the guy will go around and try another way. If there is no other way into the building, then it will simply do nothing. But if you do not keep this in mind, you might end up with a soldier running around somewhere where you do not want to have him. So be careful about doors. There's only one um, one difference for UFO do doors. UFO doors are a little bit different. In this case here you have a graphic representing the door. For UFOs there is no such door graphics. You will only have a way through. And you will not have to open them. You can simply run right through them, but you can't see through them. So as in, as if there were a wall, you cannot see inside. Everything is black behind them, but you can ri run right through without opening anything. That's a tiny little difference for UFOs. Keep that in mind. Here are only buildings, so this won't ma matter. But for UFOs, the things are a little bit different. Um, yeah, I haven't used any weapon up to now, and it's rather simple. Click on the weapon you want to use. You already can see you have a few options. You don't have always the same. In this case, you can set an aim shot or a snapshot or a auto shot. Auto shot always means you have at least two shots. Usually it's three. Some have also five shots. And you always have also the option to throw your um, gun. For example, if you have a guy which has run out of ammunition, you can throw him a weapon from some other unit. Or if you have a grenade, you, grenade, you can also throw it. And, well, one point about this list is it might also end up empty. If I choose this guy who has no time units left, I can click all I want here and it won't show anything. This is because the game only shows you the options you really can use. So if this um, guy here runs below 27 time units, then it will not show auto shot, it will show snapshot but not the aim shot, and throwing will also be shown because it's over 20 units, time units. So if I well, cancel this, Let's show you how this works. Let him run around a little. Now you can see you have the snapshot and you can throw, in, uh, throw the, the uh, gun somewhere. Let's run around a little more. And the options are completely gone. So do not be confused if your gun doesn't seem to work. Have a look at your time units. If they are too low, maybe it's just right because you cannot do anything with this gun anymore. So let's go to another guy. Now let's use one of those um, weapons. Open a hole. Get the guy out here. This is something you can do with almost every part of the map. But the point is not every tile has the same resistance to weapons. Some parts are easily destroyed. Some need several shots until they are destroyed. So. It depends on the strength of your weapon and the wall or the item you are shooting on. And one thing that is, um, well, I find it a little bit funny is uh, you can also use the melee weapons for this. For example, if you have a knife with you, you can also punch a hole into walls. You don't hear any sound, you just see a hole in your wall and you can go right through it. And this could be quite surprising because your opponent doesn't hear anything from it. I've already opened the door, which your opponent will hear. In a few moments I will show you that. But if you punch a hole in the wall, nobody will hear it. So you can um, outflank your opponent's units without them hearing anything and probably not seeing everything, anything if you're going through a building. Okay, and well, here's a special unit. It's a floater. So no human, but he also has... Um, a little bit armor, a little bit more than a human without a special armor. And what's so special about this unit is I can make it fly. 
You have these move up and move down buttons. If you move up, the guy is hovering. It's, it's quite an advantage. For example, if you're going to scout or if the terrain is a little bit more complicated, it's therefore also costing a little bit more than a normal human. There are a few other um, units, or if you're using the flying uh, suit, also humans, which can fly. So use it if you want to do some special tactics. It's quite quite useful. Okay, um, let's end the round at this point. Next moment you will see how this looks from the other side. This is how your opponent starts. And you can see he doesn't see a lot. But he will hear something. It's at least the door I will open, he will hear. There's the door. So some parts he will always hear. Also the weapons fire. There's the weapons fire. You can hear most of the things, but not everything. Moving and punching holes into walls, for example, you cannot hear. But as you can see, they are too far out. They cannot see any unit. So I will get my guys a little bit further. And one specialty about this interface is also it shows you if you guys are kneeling or not. This one here you can see has uh, those two arrows and they are both yellow. This one is kneeling and he has a blue arrow on the bottom. And this means the guy is kneeling. Kneeling will cost you four time units to get down and eight to get up. But the advantage is you have a higher accuracy. If you, well, let's take this one. He has also a plasma rifle. Accuracy is by 86%. And if I get the guy up with this button, then it's 82%. It's not that big. But if you consider a sniper rifle, it makes a difference if you have 100% or less than 100% accuracy. So it's a quite um, handy tactical aspect of the game. So use it if you want to have guys which are pretty good at aiming. Um, yeah. What else? Um, I already told you you can throw things. Not only um, rifles, but also grenades. And for this I'm going into the inventory screen. I'll describe you the inventory screen a little more in detail. You have already seen this from the setting up of the game. But difference here is, for example, if I take this grenade, nothing happens. I haven't done anything at this point. If I put it back, it won't cost me anything. I haven't done anything at this point. But... You can also see if I take the grenade, you have here this number 3, or this 13, or this 18 here. And this indicates how much time units this move will cost. If I put it in my left hand, this grenade, it's like taking the grenade from my left shoulder with my left hand, it will take me 3 time units, which has already been taken from me. So every move you do in here will be instantaneously executed. There is no way of, um, well, of stopping that. You, if you have done whatever you want to, you can put things to your um, backpack, and your shoulder, your legs, your belt. If you're done with this, you can press OK. I've taken this grenade. You can see I have two options here. I can throw it right now, which would, would be rather useless at this point because it's not primed. So I prime it with a cost of 40 time units. Won't cost me any energy but time units. And here you can pick how long will the grenade take until it explodes? And if you say zero, it will blow up the instant it uh, falls down to the ground, if you're throwing it. If you're not throwing it, but um, just putting it on the ground, it will not go off. But usually you throw it, so zero means going up the instant it drops. If you go up by one, it doesn't mean it takes an entire um, round. It will only take half of an entire round, meaning when your opponent's turn starts, it will go off. If you set it two, then your opponent will have one half of turn to do whatever he wants, and after that, so the second half of the turn, it will go off. So you will have to divide this uh, 
um, by two to see how many rounds actually it takes. So if you're saying three, then you will have the ability to move one more time and then it will go off. But usually you want to take zero. And I already am down to 29 time units, which is enough to throw something. And at this point, it's important, this control key won't bring you anything here, but the Alt key will make a difference here. If you press or keep Alt pressed, then you can see which trajectory the grenade will take. You can already see there is a certain difference up to here. It's only a brighter blue tone. If you're going further, then the left part of this trajectory is getting a darker blue, which means it's out of range. You cannot throw here. It refuses. Out of range. So you can only throw in the area which is bright blue. And there's also a second um, problem you can run into. If you go, for example, into this building, you will notice the trajectory is turning red. That's the part your grenade or whatever you're throwing will not take. So if there's a red part, then there is some sort of obstacle, which you should user usually avoid. There are some situations where this might be useful, but, well, for example, if you're inside a building, there will be no warning of any kind. The grenade will only drop before your feet and blow you up yourself. And you could check for this if you're inside a building by looking if there is any red line. And you don't necessarily need to put it on the ground. You can also, well, let's say, drop it here. But you cannot cheat the game for um, for the range of the grenade. You have a maximum range of 18 fields where you can throw in any situation. So you can go here, for example. This would be okay. You would drop the grenade also on the ground in this case. But if you imagine you have... Um, something in here and let's say the roof would be blown would already have been blown away you could also drop it from above could be quite handy because if you're trying it from here it will as you can see do everything but not go into the upper part of the building so keep that in mind that you can use different methods to throw a grenade and that it doesn't necessarily need to be on the ground I'm doing this anyways, as far as I can. And you can already see um, there's fire. If I enter this round, you will notice also smoke. And the guy is down to nine time units. Cannot do much of it anymore. Let him get up a little bit further and get him kneeling again. Um, yeah, there are also um, aspects about um, the way you can see a unit. Um, you can see already that there is a certain range where you can see. I already told you in the minimap you can see a maximum range the unit has. And, well, it depends on if your unit is looking forward or to the side. For this, I will place them. Well, place them here. Let them face sidewards, and end the round. You could also move the map with cursor keys. It's a little bit more accurate if you use. Um, HD resolution as I do, you will notice that there are some sorts of problem with the with the mouse cursor. It's a little bit sluggish. It's moving slower than your mouse actually does, so you will have some sort of delay. So don't think the guy is somehow uh, drunk or something because he, he's moving so oddly with that mouse, as you have seen a few moments before. Um, it's just because of the resolution. I like the overview, but I will have this drawback that the mouse isn't fast enough or the, the, the mouse cursor itself isn't fast enough. So now um, let the guy go here. You can see here, I can see this one right from here, which is funny as there is 
smoke. Usually you shouldn't see right through smoke. I believe this is one of those lighting bugs. So I will go further. And kneel the guy as well. Let him face sideways. End the round. Uh -huh. That's definitely a bug. Now let's go a little bit further, further, and you can see here you have three uh, fields. You can see this unit, but the unit cannot see you. If I end this round here, oh, this is what I meant, the lighting is a little bit odd here. Usually it should be more bright, but it isn't. And only now I can see the guy. I will show you this to a little bit greater um, extent. I will end this here and start a new one with a little bit better lighting. This is everything just fine. Let's get the lighting up. And a soldier here. And one here. And I will let the guy face a little bit to the side, not much. Uh, place him here, just to be sure. Let him face to the side. And end my turn. That's all I have done here. I know where he is. Ah, this is so crazy with that mouse. Let him run here. That was reaction fire triggering. You just saw. This is a specialty of all XCOM games. I already told you there is this um, value of reaction, which is set to 60. In my case here, and you have seen, if the unit is coming too close into the line of sight of a opponent's unit, then there is this um, risk of reaction fire triggering. As you have just seen, it wasn't my opponent's turn, but the opponent's unit still killed one of my units. And this is because the opponent's unit had enough reaction and had enough time units for reaction left. If you do not um, keep enough time units left, this will not happen. We don't want to save any replay. Uh, let's do it again. So now this time, running around quite a lot. And my weapon cannot be used anymore. I don't have enough time units left. Ending the round. And running right through the guy again. Yeah. Now it stopped. I'm seeing an opponent unit, which I could also do uh, to, well, get right to this unit, is clicking on this one, which centers on the unit with the designated number one here. There are several units, you will have a lot more, two, three, whatever, and if you click on it, it will center on this particular unit, but you see, it didn't react. It didn't have any time units left. I can run right through it and nothing will happen would look like this from the other side, where the guy comes into range, nothing happens. And, well, something about shooting, about aiming. I already shot into one of those walls. This time I'm going to shoot somewhere else. I'm also pressing this Alt key. And you will notice there is a yellow and a orange part. The yellow part is the undisturbed straight line of fire. If there is a orange part, that means there is some sort of obstacle. In this case, the obstacle is the opponent's unit, but it could also be a wall, for example. So, please check if this is... Well, you can see I cannot th shoot right through this lamp. 
So you can check if this is still possible to shoot or if there is some sort of problem. In this case I'm going right for the guy and while I'm clicking to shoot at the guy I'm holding the shift key and now I have the option to choose where exactly the soldier shall aim. More to the sides or more to the mids. In this case I say okay to the mids. That's it. This may not um, look very important, but if you imagine the guy is behind this window here, then it would be quite useful if the shot would go right or left or up and down. There are some maps where you also have bunkers and, well, it depends on your how your soldier is aiming at the unit. In some cases, when you're doing it wrong, it will not, never hit the enemy's unit. In other um, cases, it's a question of the aiming accuracy. Aiming accuracy is also a issue. Let's take a few soldiers more this time. Also send and start. Same here. All right. As I said, there is a certain accuracy of your shots, which is in this case the probability of hitting a target. There's only one tiny um, deviation. If you're using a sniper weapon, like this guy does, in kneeling mode, it says it has a accuracy of 100%, which should mean, well, it would hit in any case, but that's not entirely true if the um, target is out of a certain range. These 100% doesn't mean anymore that it is 100% um, likely to hit. So if you're shooting more than two tiles away, like around here, then it is not 100% sure to hit the target. But if it's somewhere around here, it is extremely likely. The other types of shot, for example the snapshot, only 70%, which means there is a chance to miss. If you are using other weapons, this could even go a little bit lower, 59% for the other shot, but um, well, we will see in a few moments. There you see. It took two shots to hit the guy. And, well, we can now turn them away so that they won't do reaction fire triggering. Give it a moment. Uh, see, this shot here went right through the, uh, a wall and didn't hit any target you wanted. Um, Let's run to the other guys. Ah, there's one of them. Two. I'm out of time units. Okay. Now let's take a auto shot. You have seen there were three shots, which is pretty certainly um, an auto shot triggering. And if I place the shot here, one, two, three, and one actually hit on this distance, which is pretty lucky. Auto shot always means it's three shots, and every single one of those shots has those 61% probability to hit the target. So you do the math, sometimes it's uh, an advantage to do auto shots, sometimes it's not. Um, now for the Sniper guy with the 100%. Let's see if he is hitting. Actually, he is. At least that's what I believe. One thing you also notice here is 
one thing you notice here is that um, you will not see the way a shot is taking if you are not having this direction of, of view. The guys here are facing to the left. They cannot see what's coming from the right here. And so the shot isn't displayed. So it also makes a difference where you're looking in consideration if you see shots flying. And yeah, the guy was hit. 43 health or 50. You see his rear armor is zero. So if, if he's getting any more shots in the back, they go right to the health. Okay. And one specialty of XCOM is that some stats are changed by the way your game is going. In this case, the guy has been shot and his uh, morale is a little bit lower than 100%. Also, his health is a little bit lower, which is obvious, okay. This lower health, but uh, yeah, the lower health is, has some problems here. You can see it's not 100% accurate anymore. It's 93%. Although he is kneeling and having the sniper rifle, 93% is okay, but all the other stats are also reduced a little bit. 93 is okay. He's hitting. But a injured soldier will always have a little less accuracy than a healthy one. This goes for shooting and throwing, as I said. And this can go even that far that you have 0% of hitting. If you are standing right next to a target, that may, that may not be a problem, but if there is some sort of distance between them, it is a problem. So a already wounded soldier shouldn't be taken as a, the gunny. It's quite um, unclever to use them, but sometimes you don't have any choice. You will have to need uh, to use a injured soldier as a last resort. So it's a little bit better than having them dead all the way. Um, yeah, firing accuracy. There's also some difference if you are using um, a one-handed or a two-handed weapon. If you change in the inventory, uh, we'll show you first the accuracy. 82% aimed shot. And now I'm taking the grenade in the other hand. And you can see it's not 82% anymore. In fact, it's quite a, uh, it has quite, it had, has used um, up its accuracy by taking something in its hand. It's only 64% because the left hand is used, but the weapon in the right hand is a two-handed weapon, a rifle. If you're using a pistol, this won't matter because pistols are one-handed weapons as well as grenades. So if you're using rifles, do not give them something in their hands. It will reduce the accuracy. 82 is quite better than 64. So you see the advantage. Um, yeah, flying is also um, an issue. If you're flying, then your accuracy is reduced. So if you can stand somewhere on the ground or on a house or something like that, or otherwise your accuracy will be reduced a little bit. Um, yeah. We have already seen um, that you can see enemy units if you can see enemy units if you are um, near enough. So if I go further with this guy. Nice reaction fire triggering. And now you see those two units. They are marked here with this one and two. But if I turn to the left, I can't see them anymore. In original XCOM, those units were remembered. So in original XCOM, those two units would still be standing here, still being displayed. In UFO 2000, it's not this way. You will have to turn back. This can be pretty annoying sometimes because in some situations you want to um, retreat your soldier and shoot with another or something like that and you will have to choose which order you do this because if you're retreating the soldier it won't see the enemy units anymore but somehow it may be that you cannot fire at them when the unit isn't retreat retreated that's a dilemma 
And, well, it's a different mechanics than in XCOM 1. Um, yeah. Um, the morale, the morale. I already told you about the morale. You can see here the morale um, bar is not 100%. There are many reasons how your uh, morale can be reduced. The morale can be affected by simple shots. If your opponent is shooting at you, then every time the morale is uh, lowered a tiny little bit, not much, but a little, it's worse when you are getting hit. This guy has been hit. You can see 21 health. He's taken quite a beating. And his morale is already down to 76%. It's even worse when a unit is killed. Which is probably the, probably the reason why this bar is so uh, small. It should be a little bit bigger. And, well, every reduction in morale... Um, Gives you the possibility that your unit is panicking or going berserk. So, in the case of panicking, the unit will drop all its weapons in its hand. It will not affect the things in your backpack or on your belt or something, but if it's carrying something in its hand, it will, it will drop it and run somewhere random. It's panicking. This is quite a problem because at the end of um, this panic round, you will not be um, able to use it anymore because the time units will be down to zero. So the guy has taken up all the time units, which is, in, especially in a situa situation like this, standing without any cover, the guy is certainly dead. The other way is the g guy is going berserk. Berserk means he's using whatever weapon he's carrying right now and shooting randomly around. This could be unproblematic if the guy is somewhere hidden. It could be quite a big problem if he's shooting your own units. And if you're very lucky he's shooting the opponent's units, but as I said, it's random. And also in this case you do not have any time units left after such a beezer ground. So it's also a problem basically. You cannot choose a target, it's a random thing. And this is all due to low morale. If your morale is getting lower and lower, your probability of such a berserk run or panicking is increasing and increasing. So games could be decided even by that. If you have two or three units left and two go panicking, well, you're done for this round probably. Yeah. Um, what else? Yeah, there's one thing I haven't told you right now. Back to the inventory screen. You can see there's those two um, yellow arrows aren't any special. If you drop something to the ground, you will see there's an additional plus. You can go, for example, to the next guy here. Okay, I can't. Time units up. Let's do it the other way. With those you can go over this corpse and take whatever is laying around here. And Sometimes it's not as easy to see if there's something on the ground. For example, if you are standing here, you do not, you do not see if there's something laying around. You cannot see it. And in case it is, there's this plus at those two arrows. So. You can even pick things up, but if your opponent is a little bit nasty, then he will take mines with him. So if you shoot an enemy unit, the mine will drop, and whoever is trying to get there is blown into pieces. Well, at this point, I will stop the game. Yes, I want to resign it. On a internet server, this would mean um, you would be losing. You could also ask for a draw if you want to. And in principle, um, well, I can show you in a fast way. Getting this guy here. This guy here. Starting the round. Running over. Mm, 
now the game is over. I will end my um, round. And in this game, this uh, case, the game is over and asks if I want to save a replay. This time I say, okay, I'll do it. Okay, you need um, a proper name. Uh, usually um, after a game, you will enter the screen here where you could still chat with your opponent without anybody else listening to the game or listening whatever you are uh, chatting here. But in this case, I don't have anything to say. I just skip yeah. it. And now here is this part with loader replay. I can choose this video replay of just now. And it will show you whatever happened at this point. That's it. In this case, it's a rather short replay, of course. But if you're having a match which is quite interesting, you can learn a lot from whatever your opponent has been doing or what was going on. So use the replay option to get better. On the UFO 2000 servers, there's always the possibility to look into stats. If the server administrator has set up certain scripts, then you can also make a ranking. And every, um, every nickname will be ranked. So if you want to get up in those rankings, you probably should watch your replays, see what has given you some advantages, where were your problems, or how did I lose this battle. Sometimes it's not exactly entirely clear, so take the replay, watch it, get better. Um, yeah, these chat messages I already told you a few minutes ago will also be displayed if you're using a internet server, but there's only uh, one half of the chat messages. Only the ch chat messages your opponent sent to you are recorded. Don't ask me why, it's just the way it is, so you will only see answers to your chats. You will never see your own chats in replays. Also, the entire map is shown in replays. We can open another one. You can here even go to pause it. And you can see the entire map here is shown. You can see everything. You can see your opponent's units. You can see, um, well, about everything. And yeah, you can, as, you, as I have shown you here, you can also set up how fast the game is um, shown. You can increase the speed, you can set it to pause, you can, um, I believe it was space, wasn't it? Oh. Well, I don't know exactly if it was space or pause, but you can also pause replay so you can look at a certain situation more closely. But as you can see, if the last move has been done, the replay automatically stops. So in this case, it might not be um, very easy because the replay is rather short. But usually you will have enough time to increase speed or slow it down or pause it. Yeah, well, in principle, that's all about what I have want to tell you here. Only thing um, I might add here is if you're going on internet servers, um, wait there let's say at least 15 minutes to half an hour or something like that. Because not always you will find a player, but if everybody is just looking in for a minute and going away, probably no one will ever see another player. So um, wait a little on those um, on the internet servers where you are playing. Um, the standard server, which is pre-programmed kind of um, when you install the game or compile it yourself, the UFO2000.net server is the standard server, the main server if you wish so. And I recommend using them first. The uh, standard server should be used first. Um, there are some other servers also running, or sometimes there are not. Um, there are only backup servers, so um, you better use the standard official server because everybody should be getting together playing there. It's rather um, 
Yeah, well, it's it's increasing likelihood to get a game running. Sometimes you will notice there is no one there for hours. If those um, few playing people are scattered around, let's say three servers or something, um, that makes gaming a little bit more unlikely. So usually it is advised to go to the official server. But if the ofi official server for some reason might be down, it's always okay to ch change to another server. In this case, it's my personal server that where nobody is playing right now, which is quite okay, which was just chosen for um, making this video. One special server right now is the OpenXCOM um, beta server. It's ufo2000.openxcom.com. Go there if the official server is down in the UFOpedia Maybe there are other servers um, listed. If you are setting up one yourself, you might enter your um, your own server in this list. So others can um, switch to this server if some problem might occur. And at this point, thank you for watching my replay. And I hope I will see you on the servers.